creation. So that's what we're talking about here. So here we go. Part 2, chapter 42. So, all right, let's look at the differences here. Late effects of radiation are those that happen, well, within months or years after, after an exposure. And importantly, they are a lot different than the early effects in that they tend to follow a linear non-threshold response. To say something, to say a response has no threshold is to say that any amount of dose, any amount of radiation could cause the response we're talking about. So if, if the response you want to talk about is cancer, right? Any amount of radiation can cause that. If the response you want to talk about is, is, a, is a birth mutation, you know, a mutation present at birth, any amount of radiation can in principle cause that and the likelihood of the thing happening goes up as you increase dose. But any dose above zero could cause the response. Linear just means you're, and notice, um, let me zoom in here. You'll notice that when we discuss these, normally, like um, when we talk about like uh, early effects, we would plot the, the, the dose gets plotted on the, on the horizontal axis. The vertical axis, what gets plotted is how bad the response is, right? So the vertical axis for erythema would be like no sunburn, a little bit of sunburn, a little more sunburn, a lot of sunburn, right? Maximum sunburn. It, it, it plots severity. The early effects we would talk about, the, the severity of the thing getting worse. You get a worse and worse sunburn with the increasing radiation dose, right? But with late effects of radiation, because they're random and not deterministic, we can't say they get worse or not. All we can say is they do or do not happen, okay? So all we can then talk about is the percent occurrence, percent incidence, or the likelihood of you developing the condition, right? You can say, in a population, if a population is all given this amount of radiation, this is how many people will manifest a, a birth defect, right? And when the exposure to the population goes up, more and more people will develop said birth defect, okay? Or whatever, the it doesn't matter what the response is, what we're talking about, but the response goes as increasing um, likelihoods, okay? So this, you can see, you can um, view the vertical axis as the percent of people within a population getting more and more, more and more of the people getting a condition, or for a single person, the likelihood of that individual developing a condition goes up. Okay, so either one are appropriate ways to to uh, to think about it. Yes. Um, so the late um, effects of radiation, so that's like later on the effects that actually happen to you, and then it happens to your offspring. That's so yeah, late effects can be genetic or somatic. Um, where the early effects were pretty exclusively uh, somatic, right, happening to you, these late effects can happen to you or your offspring. Yeah. Okay, so that's good. So we know that late effects now are different than early because they take longer to manifest. And um, there's no safe dose, right? There's no threshold for them. They can happen any dose above zero. And they tend to follow a linear response, as in you increase dose, the response increases in lockstep. Okay, so let's talk about um, some of these uh, late effects that are not necessarily going to follow that rule. Okay, so we'll start off with the exceptions. The exceptions are um, what we call, these exceptions are specifically called teratogenic effects. These teratogenic effects um, are more like somatic, but they're happening to an individual's offspring in utero, right? So they're happening to, a, to, an, to an individual, but that individual is still going through the gestation process, okay? So we're talking about an offspring um, and with, the, with the parent, with the mother, getting some, some amount of radiation during gestation. So teratogenic effects are those that occur from in utero exposure to a developing embryo or fetus. Not to be confused with mutagenic effects, which we'll discuss later. Mutagenic effects are like you get irradiated, your sex cells get changed somehow, right? And then you procreate and make a new, make a baby, and the baby gets messed up information. Okay, this idea, teratogenic effects, is you've made a baby, and then you get exposure, right? So there's the gestation process is happening, and then some exposure happens to you in the fetus, and uh, we we would want to know, you know. 
what happens at what stages. Um, really, and honestly, what this is going to be getting at is the risks of radiation to the, to a, a pregnant mom. During, during pregnancy. This is, this is what we're, that's the, that's the secret behind the scenes. We're going to talk about the risks of radiation to the pregnant female um, during gestation. So that's going to be, yeah. And um, the, the, the effects on each individual, the, the embryo versus the, the mom, may be completely different. Yes, because the embryo is much more sensitive. Remember law of Bergoni and Trabando? They say the embryos, um, so, embryonic cells would be more sensitive than... The mom could just be sick for a while and then... The, or have no and effect. And recover and then the infant... Absolutely. And the turns. infant has big effects, right? Yeah, right. infant uh, has all sorts of... We're going to talk about these terrible, terrible effects that happen. Okay. If you read the chapter, you saw some of this stuff, but... Uh, it's bad stuff. None of it, but none of it's good. No babies come out with superpowers or anything like that. Okay, it's just all bad. Um, <laughs> Okay, so um, these teratogenic effects. Why are we so? Really, if if this if this um, organism were outside of a, of the body, not gestating, right? If it were its own individual, we would refer to these as as early effects. Okay, um, we call these teratogenic effects those that happen to the to the developing fetus. We call them late effects because you don't see the effect until after birth. Okay, the effect takes months to manifest. Right. Um, even if you see the effect prior to birth, the, the effect still takes months to, to develop because it's a, it's a developing embryo. You don't see the damage until the embryo has developed, and that takes months. Um, that's why we call these a late effect, even though they, they, they seem like um, an early effect. Uh, so these teratogenic effects, these follow a nonlinear threshold. Okay, these, these act like early effects, but take months to manifest because we're talking about a developing fetus. This is an exception to the rule of no, non-threshold linear responses. The type of thing that happens to the developing embryo is entirely dependent on the stage of development. When the radiation exposure happens, um, will change what happens, right? Will determine what happens. These effects can include spontaneous abortion, reabsorption, um, I don't mean I don't mean miscarriage. I mean spontaneous abortion, as in, as in just a, a small blastula of cells gets reabsorbed into the body, right before it's any kind of noticeable anything. Just a bundle of cells. Um, you would hope, you would be surprised. I would think, because I was when I learned this, that about twenty five percent of all pregnancies are spontaneously aborted without the female ever knowing that she's pregnant. Okay, that's one in four. It's quite a bit. Um, the second option is congenital abnormalities. Congenital means you were born with it. So these are abnormalities present at birth, birth defects. Uh, third category would be mental retardation. And fourth category, latent carcinogenic effects. Latent means it doesn't manifest for a long time. And then um, when it does manifest, you, there's, there are cancerous processes that happen. So a child is born seemingly healthy and then shortly after, years down the road, maybe just a few years old or so, develops some carcinogenic process in the body, cancerous process. Which one of these happens depends on when the exposure ha happened and, and then um, how much exposure there was. You had a question? Would the, the last one, is that like, I'm guessing they, they did studies and like linked it, like there was no other way that they could have gotten cancer? Oh no, um, that already happens. Um, and then the, the rate would just increase with increasing exposure. So you look at like, you know, you look at kids born um, after the Hiroshima Nagasaki bombs, right? Higher incidence of leukemia in those children, which is a, a latent carcinogenic effect. So that would be st studies like that are where they're getting this stuff from. So the thing already, kids already get leukemia, right? Um, all over the world. And then you look at, leukemia is uh, blood cancer. Um, so kids already get leukemia, but then you look at um, the people who made children after the, you know, uh, World War II bombing, right, in Japan. And um, you look at that population, there they were getting it hot at higher rates than like the other populations were that didn't get um, bombed. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so this uh, was all pretty well done from, um, so from, we learned, remember the last time we talked about, um, we learned things from things like epidemiology, looking at um, occurrences of things within a populations, right? Um, we can also learn things from direct laboratory experiment. 
All, uh, a lot of this stuff came from both of those methods, okay? Um, so one thing that, that, you know, I told you, the experiment with mice and rats and things like that, right? A lot of these, uh, um, a lot of our understanding of what happens to the embryo with, when exposed to radiation comes from direct laboratory experimentation on these animals and looking at their, their offspring. So we'll look at that in just a few minutes. Um, Okay, so let's take a look. Um, so these, these time frames you guys are seeing, um, so gestation means, you know, the, the, the development of the embryo, right, in, in utero development. And uh, these time frames are time frames associated with um, um, a, uh, why am I losing it? A human, <laughs> human. <laughs> I don't know why I was losing a word. People, whatever we are, right? So these time frames are associated with, with, with human gestation time frames, not like mice or rat gestation time frames, which are much shorter. Um, so, you guys probably have heard things like the most risky time for pregnancy is the first trimester, right? So that'll be the first three months or 12 weeks of, of gestation, okay? So let's talk about these, these time frames. So if radiation exposures occur in the zero to two week after conception time frame, so this is very early on, right? Just a small blastula of cells. The only radiation risk to the developing blastula and very early embryo is just spontaneous abortion. Remember what radiation does to cells, right? Um, what, well, maybe, maybe we don't. What does radiation do to cells? It ionizes molecules, right? There are some molecules we call target molecules, right? What are those? What are target molecules? What's the important stuff in the cell? Um, DNA. DNA and? RNA, right, which gives instructions and then carries out the instructions, right, to build things. Uh, radiation exposure from either indirect or direct hits um, to the DNA or RNA in this de little developing blastula causes the DNA to be damaged in such a way that it cannot continue to generate new cells, okay? And when that, when that happens, um, there is just spontaneous abortion. No, uh, she had no idea she was pregnant. Um, the embryo is reabsorbed. We, and, uh, honestly, the, the better and more commonly used word is spontaneous reabsorption, right? So abortion sounds like an, in, an, an intentional thing. Um, but uh, spontaneous abortion or, or spontaneous reabsorption are the two appropriate w words to, uh, to use there. This is an all or none phenomenon. Uh, it either does or doesn't happen. Either the embryo continues on without any noticeable defect or the embryo is uh, spontaneously reabsorbed. <clears throat> this is a low probability. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, would that one is there um, any, like, any risk factors? No. No, no. So these effects happen at, at low doses, lower than would cause harm much harm to, to, to the mother. Um, let me, so let me give you the, the, cause it's, it's low probability as we say, and it's stochastic or random. Um, so we don't have a good threshold for it. Um, but we're saying it's estimated that a high dose of a hundred milligray. Um, so that's roughly our threshold, but it, there is no real threshold. Uh, 100 milligray is more than enough to cause um, some chromosome damage in, in, in even mature cells. Okay? So there can be some damage to the, to the parent, but not likely to cause much, is, is kind of what we're trying to say here. Um, but so a high doses of 100 milligray or higher, this spontaneous abortion can happen already. I told you one in four, it happens just randomly. But so any amount of radiation can cause this, more with more radiation. Uh, but Doses of 100 milligray, which are acute doses, um, would increase this already existing normal spontaneous abortion rate by 0.1%. Go ahead. So does this depend on like what part of the body you're x-raying? Yeah, we're assuming, we're assuming um, fetal, like uh, yeah, yeah uter uterine exposure to the fetus and uterus, yeah, yeah. Um, we're assuming whole body, whole, well it's not even a body, a whole organism exposure. So it's a small little blastula of cells, right? So we're assuming exposure to, to those cells. Yeah. So like not a hand x-ray, yeah, right? right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So spontaneous abortion rate, 25% is the normally occurring rate. We increase to about 25.1% with, um, um, with, with, with this acute dose of 100 milligray or higher. So low likelihood can happen. When it does happen, it increases the rate by a 0.1%, a tenth of a percent. 
After two weeks, we get into the two to eight week period. We call this is an extremely important period in, in the development process. This is referred to as the period of organogenesis. What in the world is organogenesis? Organ development, right? This is where the parts get put together and get put in their places, okay? Tissues begin to differentiate into identifiable organs. So a blastula of cells begins to differentiate. It begins to look like something, okay? Because this is the time when structure is being formed at an at a, at extremely f uh, rapid rate, um, the risk now is for birth defects. So survival is more likely, so no less likely for a spontaneous reabsorption now or a spontaneous abortion, um, and the likelihood now is for uh, birth defects. Again, birth defects are called congenital. Now, six out of uh, 100 people are born with a birth defect. So if you take, take you know, worldwide you know, uh, in, uh, studies from the world and you, you see that six out of 100 people born have some birth defect. It could be anything. We don't, we're not saying exactly what it is, but they're, they're usually some sort of skeletal deformity. Large exposures of radiation. We're not saying exactly what those large exposures are yet. We'll show you what they were in mice and how that manifested. But a large exposure to the fetus during this period, two to eight weeks, can increase the already occurring rate from about 6% to about 7%. <clears throat> Again, there's no threshold for this. So a birth defect already, birth defects already happen. Any radiation increases the likelihood of a birth defect. Large amounts of radiation increase that birth defect likelihood by about 1%. The two to five week mark, we worry mostly about stru uh, skeletal structural defects. The six to eight week mark, neurological deformities. So these are deformities in the central nervous system. You know, your central nervous system is very, very radio resistant. I mean, you really can't hurt it. The way, I mean, even with you know, the most acute levels of radiation, um, you die from them, but you don't die because your brain, your nervous system got damaged. You die because the supporting system around it, the blood vessels and all that around it would rupture. Your nervous system is very, very radio resistant. However, not when it's being put together, right? Not when those cells are developing and differentiating. When the cells of your nervous system are being put together during, during gestation, they are radio sensitive because they haven't completely differentiated yet. They're still rapidly dividing and that makes, us, makes them at, at high risk for, um, for deformity. Let's take a look at um, these two guys, these two rats, okay? They don't give us the dose, I think. It might be in the text, but I don't remember. It doesn't matter. The, the two rats were exposed to equal doses of radiation, okay? Both exposed to high doses of radiation in, during gestation, okay? Um, now, you'll notice the rat's eyes don't look the same, right? So the rats had relatively similar structural um, um, structure, skeletal structure, but their neurological structure got deformed, okay? You'll notice the rat on the left Rat A exhibits what's called anophthalmia. The eyes did not develop, okay? This rat's eye right here, right? Um, hang on. Yeah, no, okay. I, I was reading this and looking at this, and I was, I was hearing and seeing two different things. Uh, anyway, th this rat on the right has a normal right eye. Okay, so this eye where my laser pointer is over right now, that's a normal right eye on this rat. Okay, the left eye on this rat was deformed, neurological deformity. The brother or sister rat to that one, this one here, okay, did not develop eyes. So there's out of the four eyes on screen here, 75% of them did not develop from a high dose of radiation. Okay, so this is a neurological deformity from in utero exposure. This is what we were just talking about here. This is the two to eight week exposure. This one's a little sad, but here's a litter of nine rats, okay? These, are, these were all at the same, these are all the same age, right? These are all, these are all in one, one gestational sac. So a litter of nine rats exposed to high doses of radiation in utero. From left to right, you see different effects, okay? So on the left, X encephaly, the brain's outside of the head. 
this one, exencephaly, with evisceration. You'll notice that if we, I, don't, I know it's a little gross, but if you zoom in on this, this rat, this one that's on, on, on the middle, this middle rat here, the organs are all outside of the body. Okay, that's a birth defect. It happens to people too sometimes. Uh, that's a birth defect. This rat's born with the brain outside of the head, normal rest of it. This one's born with the brain outside of the head and organs outside of the body. Both of these are not compatible with living rats. This third one though, this one, it's a normal rat. So one out of nine of those rats did not develop a birth defect, okay? The birth defects are likely to occur, more likely to occur with increasing dose, but in a litter that's large like this, one of them gets away without having any, uh, I mean, it's dead, because they, you know, they took it out, but uh, one of them gets away without having any damage. These two develop what's called anencephaly. Anencephaly means you were just born without the, the head. So no, no cranium, no brain. Um, so you have structural, like skeletal deformities, as well as neurological deformities. These bottom four are blastulas that never, um, never developed. These, would, these were uh, removed. So these, would, these little bundles of cells uh, would have otherwise uh, reabsorbed in, back into the body, but these four were um, removed from the mother during, um, you know, af after the exposure. The cells stopped developing and they were just removed from the mother so they could be shown to you guys. So there you go. Nine animals, one of them has a normal birth, the other eight had abnormal births or didn't or, or would not have been born and all had all manifested different effects. Okay, that's enough of that. Let's go to the eight to 12 week mark. So now we're getting to the end of the first trimester now. We're, we're, and, and, and importantly, we are past the main parts of organogenesis, right? So structure's already there. Once structure's formed, you can't unstructure it, right? So it's already there. We're less, like, less likely to develop birth defects. The developing fetus becomes clear of the risk for morphological deformities. Morphological just means uh, problems with structure, shape. <clears throat> so our risk now is for underdevelopment of the central nervous system, mental retardation. This is normal in about six out of 100 births, 6%. High doses increase to about 7%. Hopefully the takeaway that you're getting from this is bad things already happen. Radiation increases those bad things happening, but not by a lot. It's not like it goes from 6% to 50%, right? It goes from 6% to 7%, right? Six out of 100 to seven out of 100 develop the thing, right? It's not a big difference. Nature's already playing games, right? That's, that's important. That's why we chance, why we can evolve. Because nature's already playing games with our genetic code, changing it around, mutating randomly, um, and selecting for beneficial mutations, right? So mutations are happening all the time. Almost all mutations are bad. That's how nature does this. It's a numbers game though, right? If it has, you know, the more and more, more and more organisms that develop, the more likelihood there is to be one of them that's gonna have a, a, good, a good mutation. All right, so the, the problem is with in utero exposure, the first trimester, okay? The first trimester, as you just saw, is when we go from a blastula of cells to building a skeleton to developing a brain, right? In that first 12 weeks, we're doing a lot of development in that time. So we say clearly the first trimester is the most sensitive for potential uh, radiation harm. You want to, if at all possible, avoid exposure to the, to the fetus during the first trimester. You want to avoid during the entire gestational period, but the first trimester is when we're most at risk for all of these congenital defects. Um, this example below says, uh, for example, the relative risk for developing leukemia in utero uh, uh, from in utero radiation exposure by tri trimester is you have an eight point, r roughly an eight times higher risk of developing leukemia if your exposure happens during the first trimester um, compared to, so your risk of developing leukemia is, is 
one in this case. And so the risk is higher, so it goes from one to 1.5 if the exposure happens during the second trimester. One goes to 1.4 if it happens during the third trimester. But it's eight times higher during the first trimester. The risk of developing you know, blood cancer is eight times higher during the first trimester if the exposure happens at that point. Okay, so our first trimester uh, of gestation is the most risky for um, congenital defects, spontaneous abortions, all of these um, uh, teratogenic effects. Okay, there is no threshold, a uh, 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 hard and fast threshold for these, but we have sort of an, an idea, okay? So this, the NCRP puts out, puts out reports periodically, and, and one report states that less than 10 milligray to the fetus, little to no evidence for injury. 50 milligray to the fetus, detectable abnormalities in the central nervous system, congenital malformations, and increased evidence of tumors. Let me pause there. That 50 milligray is the threshold dose in, in a, in a, in a you know, human, person, a, 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 you know, a, an adult, let's say, uh, it's the threshold dose for chromosome aberrations. Uh, chromosome damage does not tend, does, has, the threshold for chromosome damage for people is 50, gray, 50 milligray, okay? Below that, no damage. Above that, we see chromosome damage. That is also the threshold for congenital defects, um, detectable congenital defects in, in a developing embryo, okay? They're the same. That's the, that's the number, 50 milligrays, the number, amount of radiation at which we start to see damage to the DNA. And in a developing embryo, damage to the DNA manifests as, as structural problems, right? Problems with, with building the thing. It's like taking your, you know, your Lego manual and scrambling it all up and then trying to build the Lego thing you're building, right? It's not going to get built correctly. Okay. 500 milligray. A decrease in head size and stature, and a five times increase in the risk of mental retardation. So um, this is a lot of exposure. This ex this amount of exposure is going to be, you know, during computed tomographies, th things like that. You have to get you, you have to have very relatively high levels of exposure to cause that. That's 500 milligrams a lot. And the first eight weeks, the organogenesis and prior, uh, the embryo is about ten times more sensitive to radiation than an adult. Okay. So it is true, the embryo is much more sensitive to radiation than we are for several different reasons, right? So recall back to the laws of Bergoni and Trabando, they say undifferentiated, like stem cells, are more sensitive than differentiated, specialized, like nervous cells, nerve cells, so that the level of differentiation matters. The less specialized a cell is, the more sensitive it is, as well as the rate of mitosis, okay? Real quick, what's mitosis? cell splitting, right, cell division. If a cell divides rapidly, high rate of mitosis, it, it is, it is uh, more at risk for damage from radiation. It's more radiosensitive. So the th two things that make the cell radiosensitive are the degree of specialization and the rate of mitosis, okay? Embryonic cells are undifferentiated or less differentiated than adult cells, and they have a higher rate of mitosis because they're building a person, right? So those cells, why these cells are, are um, so much more at risk for harm from radiation because they're so much more sensitive than human cells. And this first eight weeks, organogenesis and prior, about 10 times more sensitive than, than the adult. Yes? Why is the specialization rate, like, I don't think that if it was a more specialized cell, it would be more likely. Oh, good. It's basically once the structure is, is built, once we have our structure, it's hard to hurt that structure. And if we don't have the structure, it's easy to damage the unstructured cell. Um, and it's, it, and the why is, is harder, but it comes straight from, from the data on, on rats and mice and flies. We see that uh, these undifferentiated cells are harmed just quicker and easier than the differentiated specialized ones. 
neurons, right? Highly specialized, can't hurt them, right? Whereas just, um, um, intestinal lining cells, right? Uh, very easy to hurt. They're not differentiated, not highly differentiated. Stem cells too. So um, it's just it's a it's a correlation, right? We see undifferentiated cells are correlated with easy to damage. Okay. Period for, so we just talked about three periods of, of time frames, three time frames for damage, right? Zero to two weeks, two to eight weeks, eight to 12 weeks. Those are the first three periods that we're calling, uh, uh, for, we're talking about for teratogenic effects. Those three periods are all part of the first trimester of gestation. What we're calling period four is just any time after the first trimester and, and to birth, okay? If exposure happens in this time, to the embryo, the risk is for latent carcinogenesis. The risk is uh, an increasing likelihood of developing a cancerous process after birth. Various kinds of cancer can occur at any stage in life, but all of them can also be from other causes. Cancer happens, right? You have roughly a, a um, it's roughly a one in three, some people might say, you know, um, two in five, but it's, it's roughly 20 to 30% likelihood of developing some cancerous process in your lifetime. You have roughly a one in three likelihood. Um, so that's happening anyways, right? That likelihood goes up a little bit with exposure after the first three months. So it's still risky. It's still risky to give a pregnant female a, a, a dose of radiation you know, at, at the level of the uterus. Um, but it's less risky after the first trimester. That's the, that's the thing we're trying to get across. Um, a special concern for us is, is adolescent leukemia, childhood leukemia, um, which is rare unless it's caused by fetal exposure to radiation. And then, yeah, the fetus after the first trimester is, so the first eight weeks of gestation, the fetus is about 10 times more sensitive than the adult. Late, late, the late fetus, uh, so from, you know, 10 weeks on, uh, well, eight weeks on, um, it's lower. It's only about two times more, more radio sensitive than the adult. So you'll, you'll, you should be seeing that once we have structure, right, once we have the structure built, it's harder to, to damage it. All right. The risk for latent carcinogenesis peaks at about three months gestation, afterward decreasing with time. In the third trimester, latent carcinogenesis is the only substantial remaining risk for the fetus uh, due to radiation exposure. Okay, let's backtrack to one of our first talks about the units of radiation, okay? Um, it was back in chapter 40, I think. We talked about units of radiation, and I gave you units for exposure, absorbed dose, dose equivalent, and effective dose. Ignore effective dose and dose equivalent for right now. Let's talk about exposure and absorbed dose, okay? If I expose you to one gray of radiation, doesn't matter how much of you, but if I expose you to one gray of radiation, you have one gray of exposure that could get into your body, right? One gray of possible exposure. So you won't absorb more than that. What do we say? How much of what you're exposed to do you absorb? Um, 1% is what, if we're talking about like the creation of the x-ray image, 1% is what passes through to form the image, but ignoring that right now, just talking about radiation exposure to the body, if I expose you to one gray of radiation, I let turn the x-ray machine on, one gray of radiation hits the surface of your skin, how much of that one gray gets, in, gets into you? Uh, what would you say? It's in a, a third? A third is going to become important, but it's not for that. Only 1% of the beam, roughly speaking, passes through you, right? Which means about 99% of the beam stays within you, right? It's about equal, okay? Whatever you're exposed to is what you end up absorbing. If I expose you to one gray of x-rays, you, your absorbed dose is one gray of x-rays, okay? So 
what your entrance skin exposure is, is what your absorbed dose is. Okay, if I expose you to 50 milligray, your exposure is 50 milligray, then your absorbed dose is 50 milligray. Okay, it's not exactly, it's about 96% of what you're exposed to, but for the purposes of, of the radiography classes, we say that's a one to one relationship. Whatever you're exposed to is what you absorb. Okay, now think about the fetus. Okay, the fetus's skin level is well below the mother's skin level, right? The fetus is underneath the mom's abdominal organ, uh, sorry, not abdominal organs, underneath the skin, underneath the muscle, underneath the fascia of the abdomen, right? And then it's inside the uterus, which is its own muscle, right? Floating around in fluid. The uterus, uh, uh, sorry, the fetus has all of this stuff in its way. So the fetus's entrance skin exposure will not be the same as the mom's entrance skin exposure, okay? So we might, we might wanna know if we expose the mom to some radiation, how much of that gets to the fetus, right? And it's not, um, it's not 100%. Okay, so fetal exposure should not be confused with the mother's entrance skin exposure because there is a filtering effect of the tissues above the fetus, the mom's tissues above the fetus. Again, uh, skin, abdominal or skin, like subcutaneous tissue, abdominal organs, um, the uh, abdominal, sorry, abdominal muscles, um, the uterus, and then the, the fluid, right? So all of that counts as filtration, and all of that is absorbing the beam as it's traveling through towards the fetus. All of that beam is being um, filtered, okay? So we find that at mid-gestation, now obviously the larger the child gets, sort of the thinner mom's or uh, um, uterus gets and the closer it gets pushed to the surface of the skin, right? But at mid-gestation, we say the fetus receives approximately one-third, roughly, of the mother's entrance skin exposure. So the fetus's entrance skin exposure is about 30% of what mom gets. So if you give mom one gray of entrance skin exposure, mom gets an absorbed dose of one gray, okay? but the fetus gets an absorbed dose of about 300 milligray, okay? Uh, entrance skin exposure to the fetus is about 300 milligray, so is their absorbed dose. So it's about one, it's again, about one third of what mom gets. Um, because most diagnostic procedures that we do do not give a person a high entrance skin exposure, so they do not give the person a high absorbed dose, the fetus is gonna get a third of whatever the mom gets, right? So the fetal risk is very low, okay? Um, most diagnostic procedures pose little or no risk to the fetus, which is not within the primary beam. Again, you know, um, you're, you're not gonna be, you know, radi uh, radiographing the pregnant mother. Let me show you one thing real quick. I'll pass this around so you guys can get a look at it. This is the only time I've ever seen direct fetal exposure, okay? This is a mom after a car accident. This is a, a late stage fetus uh, in, in the mom after the car accident. You can see um, you can see the mom's spine and pelvis here, but in the image, and when you have this up close, you'll see it. There's a cranium here and a spine running up that way, okay? You can see the little fetus there. Usually, the fetus is not within the primary beam. We do have to x-ray a pregnant mom. Fetus is not gonna be within the primary beam. However, in something like, I didn't take this x-ray by the way, this is my, um, um, hmm? Yeah, yeah, so she had a car accident, right? And um, they're, they need to make sure she doesn't have any, any, any fractures, right? And in order to do that, they have to take the radiograph. So um, they collimate wide right? Shoot for large amounts of area so that they have to minimize the number of exposures they would need to make, right? You don't want to make many, many exposures. Um, so, but, but typically the fetus is not, typically the fetus is not going to be within the primary beam, okay? If it is within the primary beam, whatever the entrance skin exposure is for the mother, the fetus will be at about a third of that. The procedures that concern us for fetal exposure include abdominal C-arm 
radiography. C-arm is, is a type of, if you haven't seen it yet, it's a type of x-ray machine that basically can reach around a patient like a big letter C, okay? And we use them in surgery. Um, it allows us to take a live video x-ray, fluoroscopy. Um, we worry about this fetal exposure during angiography and cardiac catheterization, right? Cardiac catheterization is going to involve, you know, this area, right? The thorax and the fetus is just below that. So even though it's not within the primary beam, we worry about scatter exposure. Exposures are high during these, during these procedures anyways. Uh, barium enemas, gastrointestinal studies, urograms, radiation therapy. All of those things are high-level radiation um, procedures, and they all put the, would put the fetus at risk. So the risk becomes very, very high. And so, but every x-ray that's ever been done on any person ever had some risk, okay? But the risk was always low, right? And the reward is high. You know, the reward is I get to see the inside of you and see what's going on, right? And the risk is relatively low, okay? However, with the pregnant female, the risk gets higher right and the benefit becomes relatively less you know beneficial right the, the benefit is still there you still have the same benefit but now the risk is higher the risk reward is not um may not be um you know conducive to the doctor ordering the x-ray so typically they don't have to the doctor will not order the x-ray on the pregnant female all right let's take a five minute break